right in the center of Moscow, in the nice neighborhoods. Today, Sergei decided to take two of his friends for a short stroll to the top of this building. It's a residential building for the elite with beautiful apartments, which there are plenty of in Moscow. At the back of the building, the door didn't hold out for long. I have a universal set of magnetic keys. We use these to get in. They open about 75% of the buildings in Moscow. Sergei, 23, is not a burglar, but an adrenaline junkie. We're good. The door to the roof is open. We can go without any issues. With his gang, he spends his time on the roofs of Moscow in search of a thrill. At 60 meters above the ground, the view is breathtaking over the entire city center. But for Sergei, it's still not high enough. With a camera fixed to his helmet to immortalize his performance, he's going to climb the spire that tops the building. This is the latest trend among young Muscovites, the unauthorized ascent of the city's tallest monuments. Sergei's greatest achievement is having to climb the seven skyscrapers built by Stalin with his bare hands, which dominate Moscow. Here is the video of his last conquest, an official building that culminates at 138 meters. It was last summer, with two accomplices, and without any safety equipment, that Sergei reached the Soviet star at the top of the building. A video that he then posted on the internet. We did it. And he is not the only one. Because on the web, dozens of teenagers from Moscow set themselves increasingly dangerous challenges. At 370 meters on this crane, at the top of a skyscraper, they risked their lives in the middle of a snowstorm. And the competition isn't just for boys. On this ledge, a teenager performs a balancing act, which is potentially lethal. I'm getting such an adrenaline rush. Yeah, I did it. There are no official statistics, but in Moscow, this new trend has already claimed several victims. At the very top of its lightning rod, Sergei takes his time for one last photo. Everyone knows that Russians can do crazy things, things that you, in the West, view with astonishment. Everyone is wondering how we can do stuff like this. In Moscow, young people seem to have lost their minds. In the heart of the largest capital in Europe, we discovered a disoriented generation. More and more young Muscovites risk their lives for a few seconds of thrill. It's Serge is really search. stupid. He's he is crazy. crazy. In the suburbs, some are joining ultranationalist movements who hunt down illegal immigrants and have them deported. If you don't have papers, we'll call the police. I hope they will deport you and that you will give birth in your country. Other young people fall into violence and are spreading terror in the streets of Moscow. Stop fucking hitting him. You're going to kill him. 
even the golden youth is looking for bearings. The Russian elite is suffering from a bad image abroad. Some want to relearn manners. Thanks to a French countess. Hello, madam. Before, communism was built, we had other goals, and now it's the return of former Russia. We went out to meet this new generation, who never knew the Soviet Union. And we discovered young Muscovites, in the midst of an identity crisis, in the heart of a capital, where no extremes hold back. In the suburbs of Moscow, a demonstration is closely surveilled. Surrounded by lines of anti-riot police officers, the ultranationalists show their power. Fur hats, uniforms, glory to Russia. Among the procession, we find traditional patriotic folklore. As every year, these demonstrators commemorate a military victory dating back 400 years over the Polish invader. But here is the new face of Russian nationalism. Young people, even teenagers, boys and girls alike, they are now the ones who make up the bulk of the troops. Today, there are more than 7,000 in the procession. Their conviction, the return of a great white Russia. Moscow, Russian city. Russia for Russians. Huyana, 24, belongs to one of the most active branches of the movement. Glory to Russia. This young stay-at-home mother is one of the main instigators of an anti-immigration militia with an evocative name. The Guest Busters Project is one of our main programs. It is a project that is directed against illegal immigration. We all know the Ghostbusters movie. Our name and logo are inspired by it. We are the intruder hunters. Russia first. The target of Huyana and her friends are ethnic minorities. Armenians, Azeris, Uzbeks, or Tajiks who came to settle in Russia. These immigrants are for the most part from the former republics of the USSR, located in the Caucasus zone or Central Asia. At least one million of them have immigrated to Moscow to find work. I didn't recognize you. In the procession, there are even French speakers. Hi, how is it going? Are you from France? Long live Madame Le Pen. They are our strategic allies. Even though these nationalists have the right to demonstrate, they are forbidden from political parties because the authorities accuse them of being controlled by neo-Nazis. In the procession, a few arms stretched out peeking out in front of our camera. An act punishable by immediate arrest. There are always provocateurs, people who are not quite normal. Some people who come, we don't know why or what they want. We can get them out one by one, but our objective it is to completely exclude them from our demonstrations. Huyana may try to portray a respectable image. But the movement she belongs to is clearly extremist. On this inside video, shot last summer, here's Huyana in the red dress and brown hair. Beside her, the ultranationalist leader Dmitry Demushkin, a man who has not always donned the suit of respectable politics. In this second undated video, he appears in a different kind of outfit. Let's write a new page in contemporary national socialism. The future is ours. The future will always belong to young people. Long live our nation. Glory to Russia.
Although these extremists are excluded from the political game, in Moscow, they are gaining ground. According to a recent survey, two-thirds of the population are in favor of the idea of a white Russia, a figure that rises to over 80% in Moscow. With this rise in the ambient xenophobia, the guest busters are determined to exploit it. Like every weekend, Guyana and her militia engage in their favorite activity finding and handing over illegal immigrants to the police. We created a No to Migrants website, where people can post reports on an interactive map of the city. They write to us, they phone us, there are a lot of requests. In the suburbs of Moscow, there are many whistleblowers. A few days ago, a resident of this building left an anonymous message on the Guestbusters website to denounce the presence of illegal immigrants in the basement. And just this morning. Hello. Do you live here? No. What are you doing here? Can we go in? No. Can we go to the basement? No. Why not? What do you have in there? Do you live in there? No. Why do you say we can't go in? Because it's not my decision. Call the manager then. He's going to leave. He's not coming back. Do you have your identity papers? Show them to us. Guestbusters act like police officers, and yet they have absolutely no right to do what they do. No, no. You stay there. The teenager does not speak Russian very well. The militia members are convinced that he is an illegal immigrant. Why are you pushing me? No, I'm not pushing you. I'm here if you want to talk to me. Leave me alone. Good morning. I'm on street, number six. On the other end of the phone, the police. The guestbusters want to have the basement opened and arrest any illegal immigrants who might be there. Hi, are you the district police officer? Yes. Tell us why it would appear that there are people who live in this basement. What basement? Show me. Come with me. The basement is locked. So the guest busters will put pressure on the police officer by unnerving him. Their method is filming it all using Uyana's cell phone. Can you introduce yourself? I'm a trainee inspector. Your name? Sergei Oligovich. Last name? Alexeev. Alexeev Sergei Oligovich? Yes. You're not quite an inspector. Exactly. And you don't know that there are people who live here? No, there were never any complaints from the residents of the building. And it worked. The inspector picks up the keys from the caretaker. Hello, what's up with the basement? Who has the keys? And a few moments later, the policeman has the door open. Huyana, hot on his heels. There are rugs on the floor. Look. They've diverted pipes to install a kitchen. They're stealing everything. There's everything you need to make food. Here, look. There are dishes. Let's see what's in here. God, there are lots of cockroaches. The anonymous tip was correct. As we can see, several people have taken up residence here. Here are their beds. Be careful, there are cockroaches everywhere. Everything seems to indicate that the basement occupants were still there that morning. They probably left to go to work. There is a leak here, the pipes are pierced. Restrooms. And even a bathroom. Give me the key. The policeman had seals placed on the door. We are trying to interview the teenager. Where do you live? I live here. 
And how many people live with you? Two. There are two of us. Only two. But there are more beds. Are there women here? Answer, are there women living here? There is no one else. Apart from you, who lives there? No, there is no one else. How many other immigrants live with you? Against all odds, the teenager is arrested. Huyana gloats. Because if he does not have papers, he will be deported. In the neighborhood, the guest buster methods are, however, far from being unanimously accepted. I have nothing against immigrants. I advise you not to martyr them. I saw your content, and it left me with a very unpleasant impression. You're against it, but you wouldn't be if when you came home at night you were being raped by Tajiks. I don't know. But there are good people and bad people everywhere. A rapist could very well be Russian. So associating a nationality with a crime is really unfair. Protests that won't stop the guest busters continuing to persecute illegal immigrants. In the red building over there, we think there are immigrants. A little further on, they have an appointment with a local woman who contacted them to report illegal immigrants. Are they there now? I don't know. Last night we went to see. They were there. Maybe they went to work. In this building, the entire technical floor is supposedly housing illegal immigrants. My bathtub isn't even as nice as this one. As in the previous building, the place has been transformed into a ramshackle camp. Except that here. The occupants are present. At the back of this room, a pregnant woman is hiding under blankets. Do you understand that you are not allowed to be here? I'll go. When are you leaving? How far along are you? Two months. Only two months? You have plenty of time to leave, you could even walk home. Stop crying. Just because you're sobbing doesn't mean we're leaving, it's not going to change anything. Please stop. I'm sick. I have toxicosis. Toxicosis? Well, you'd better go home. The climate is better there, it's hotter. Please stop. I'm going to go home. If you don't have papers, we call the police. I hope they'll deport you and that you'll give birth in your own country. A few minutes later, the same trainee inspector makes an appearance. He will be forced to arrest the woman. A successful day for Huyana. The guest busters got a teenager and a pregnant woman arrested. But the young militia woman has no qualms. If you have to feel sorry for pregnant women, the sick, the old, or women with children, they will continue to come here en masse. And we will never get rid of them. Either we approach the problem without prejudice, regardless of gender, age, or children, or we do nothing at all. You have to take the problem in its entirety or not deal with it at all. Run-of-the-mill xenophobia that will have very tangible repercussions. The pregnant woman is taken to the police station. Without papers, she was deported a few days later to her country of origin, Tajikistan. Each year, these nationalist youth militias get dozens of illegal immigrants in Moscow's suburbs arrested. With 12 million inhabitants, Moscow is now the largest city in Europe. Around the historic center, from Red Square and the Kremlin, the city extends over more than 15 times the size of Paris. To get around in this megalopolis, the number one mode of transport is the Electrica, the suburban train. And for some teenagers in the capital, Moscow suburban trains have recently become the subject of a dangerous game. 
That's normal in Moscow. It happens here often. On the platform of one of the city's main train stations, we find Sergei, the acrobat who climbs Moscow's skyscrapers. With these suburban trains, he's found a new way to risk his life. We're going to get on a train. The first one that goes by. Yes, Russian high-speed trains. For anyone climbing onto trains, it's their favorite line. This is where you can find the newest trains in all of Russia. Obviously, it is totally forbidden and extremely dangerous. And that's exactly what teens are looking for, always chasing a spectacular video to post online. We film all the time, in case something interesting happens. Sometimes the police or security guards show up and shout, my God, get off. As it happens, two security guards are patrolling the station platform. They didn't notice anything. Did you turn on your camera? Switch on your camera. In front of the commuters, Sergey jumps on the bandwagon. Here, it doesn't seem to shock anyone. Go fuck yourselves. They were the security guards at the station. They can't do anything to us now since the train is already moving. Anyway, in Moscow, nobody cares anymore. There are so many people hanging off the back of trains that no one bats an eye. Indifferent security guards and a non-dissuasive fine. 100 rubles, not even 2 euros, for any team that gets caught. I'm going up now, out of the way. It's uh, very Sergey is so stupid. <laughs> He's crazy. He's crazy. And what Are you, you? Are you crazy, crazy too? Uh, I'm, yes, I am. Uh, crazy too. In just one year, this practice has caused seven deaths among young Muscovites. All electrocuted or thrown onto the tracks. The youngest was 14. But Sergei and his gang don't seem to realize the danger lying in wait for them. Yes, it can be fatal without a doubt. There are a lot of young people who fall. You can get electrocuted, seriously injured, fall between the cars. There are people, children who are losing arms and legs, when that happens to them, they don't understand, they climb up, and they don't think about the consequences. When we do it, we are aware of all these consequences. Here's our train. These teens willing to risk their lives for a few seconds of adrenaline prefer to climb onto the train roof. The danger is omnipresent because they only have a few seconds to climb up before departure. <laughs> And most importantly, they will travel less than one meter under high voltage lines. At 50 miles per hour, Sergei, the group veteran, risks it all. But what worries him the most is his comrade's safety. Can you hear me? Don't turn your back while walking. When you're on the roof, the danger is the power line just above our heads. Now, now, duck. Be fucking careful. What he's doing is very dangerous. He shouldn't be so upright when the train is in motion. The pantograph connects the high voltage line to the locomotive. You definitely shouldn't touch it. Otherwise, you risk being electrocuted. But what Sergei doesn't know is that he risks death even without touching the cable. 
The simple fact of being within three meters of the high voltage line can cause a deadly electric arc at any moment. In Moscow, it is estimated that there are at least 2,000 teenagers who risk their lives on suburban trains on a daily basis. Come on, let's go down to the platform. So, who are these disoriented teenagers for whom this deadly game has become a drug? They didn't want to introduce us to their families. Some of them even told us they were orphans. We asked them why, like so many Moscow teenagers, they risk their lives on a daily basis. I have nothing else to do. Only because you have nothing to do. It's also to have company, and we travel for free. He wants to film something amazing and post it on the internet, for it to go viral all over the world and for its popularity to explode. He wants to become famous and for everyone to know him. Bigger than the Empire State Building? Whatever. He wants to be in the news. He wants all the students to admire him. I do want that. Headlines, no, but school children, yes. Whoever dies stupidly on a train or elsewhere becomes a hero. He did something. He died. He's a hero. That's the way it is. A one and a half hour train ride from central Moscow, Sergei finally agreed to take us to his home. He makes a living by reselling used computer equipment. Sergei lives in a building dating from the Soviet era. In a studio, that serves as a place to crash for the whole gang. This is where I live. I live like everyone else, except that at home, there are always friends squatting. On his computer, Sergei keeps the video of his latest crazy exploit. It was last November. With an accomplice, he risked his life on the roof of the Russian high-speed train. That morning in Moscow, it was minus 11 degrees. Destination, the city of St. Petersburg, 400 miles away. Almost London Inverness at an average speed of 125 miles per hour. After three and a half hours of travel, they finally enter St. Petersburg Station, safe and sound. Sergei and his accomplice were immediately arrested, but the punishment was very light, only a two euro fine each. Last year, one of their friends died on this high-speed train at over 125 miles per hour. His name was Gregory. He was one of the best known in our business. He was blown off by the wind. He couldn't hold on. He fell off the train and died like that. Did his death scare you? No, it made me sad. It was really stupid. A death that was absolutely no lesson. The dream of Sergei and his gang is to go to New York to shoot more spectacular videos on the roofs of Manhattan skyscrapers and subways. In Moscow, it's not just the reckless who film their exploits. In the streets, Thousands of other cameras are filming every day, relentlessly. Dash cams from a small video recorder that more and more motorists install behind their windshield to prove their good faith in the event of a problem. Because with 800 dead and nearly 15,000 injured every year, Moscow is the European capital of road accidents. Accidents that are often recorded by dash cams. And on the internet, you can even find compilations of the most amazing videos.
spectacular pileups. Tanks crossing without warning. And even an airliner crash. Filmed at the end of 2012 on a highway that runs along one of Moscow's airports. An avalanche of shocking images that give the world the impression of a Russia in the midst of hysteria. Pull in here, please. Lieutenant Celestnev from the Moscow Traffic Police has thus become an internet star in spite of himself when he stopped a young driver on this highway ramp. These barriers were a bit further back then. I had it stowed on the right side. The whole scene was recorded by the driver's dash cam. I had already dealt with him. I had already arrested and fined him once. He recognized me and that's when he stepped on the accelerator, deliberately. With the radio at full volume, the young driver took off with the lieutenant for more than 800 meters and accelerated to over 55 miles per hour. Stop. 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 Leave me alone. Before throwing him off right in the middle of the road. At this point, he swerved to the left, and that's where I fell. I was wearing a motorcycle vest and knee pads. It was all shredded, but that was what saved my life. My vital organs were affected. I had a hemorrhage in my left kidney. Fortunately, it wasn't serious. The driver continues his race at high speed. A few hundred meters away, he abandons his car and was immortalized by her dash cam. He was arrested an hour later. He's 30 years old and was driving with a fake license. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Today's youth no longer have the education we had before. I say it again and again, they have no education, no more respect, neither on the roads, nor for others. While some of the most disadvantaged young Muscovites are on a downward spiral, others are trying to relearn forgotten values. A stone's throw from the Kremlin in a much more privileged environment. A VIP party. Pretty girls dressed in high fashion. Luxury jewelry and branded champagnes. This glamorous universe is that of the Moscow queen of good manners, Larissa Evans. This former marketing director is the founder of a unique school in Russia, the International School of Etiquette, which teaches life skills to the golden youth. And Larissa is very committed to its principles. I'm holding champagne. This is how you hold your champagne glass the French way. This is what I've been told. It was a French aristocrat who showed me how to she do it. You never hold it by the base like that. The English do that. This is more chic. It's a French style. Cheers. A little trick that Larissa always uses to start a conversation. Because although she assiduously frequents social evenings, it's not just for fun, but to promote her school. As we can see, the new elite is not insensitive to her arguments. We rich Muscovites go to the trendiest parties, not only in Russia, but also in Europe, in the United States and all over the world. So, we do need to know how to dress, which nice bow tie to choose, or how to hold a glass of champagne. Right now, you're holding it, 
the English way. Larissa has chosen to get into the life skills business because today there is a real demand. Through traveling, the former marketing director realized that she and her compatriots still often suffer from a deplorable image abroad. We, have reputation that we, we are often given the reputation of being dressed no too occasion. conspicuously, so of wearing, wearing too much, much jewelry, jewelry. We never of smile. never smiling, we do not never saying say hello, hello. Not or not friendly, being very kind. That's a Those are the cliches. Are some of these cliches true? Yes. yes. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. This morning, Larissa is visiting one of her wealthiest clients who lives in the suburbs of Moscow. We're going to We're Russian heading to the most exclusive Russian neighborhood in so Russia. Area called Rubliovka. A neighborhood That's called Rubliovka. That's where President Putin lives. Real and as well as all the rich and important people, people in Russia. Of Russia. Rubliovka is a forest six miles west of Moscow. Behind trees and fences, the home of oligarchs, movie stars, or the most influential politicians in the country are hidden. This is the guy who built this the one even had a church built on his property. This is what I told you. Look. See that's a uh, church. Do you see the church? This is a serious It's a hell of a house. Obviously and look, you can see there are a lot of cameras. cameras. And probably there's not only There's one probably building, not just one building just inside. A very discreet and ultra secure luxury bubble monitored by the police or security guards armed with assault rifles. Hola. Olga, hi, glad to see you. Larissa's client is a former model, married to a leading political leader. Today, Olga Volga has returned to oil painting. I painted this one and then that one. When you talk particularly about Rublyovka, in Rublyovka, um, there is a lot of money, find, uh, lots of but money also a lot of vulgarity, of vulgarity and bad and taste. Bad taste. I mean, in Olga's house, but in Olga's house, the, you can see everything is done elegantly and tastefully. Um, elegance and taste. A refinement that Olga learned at Larissa's manners classes. She was one of her very first clients. Today, Olga has become an expert in the art of receiving guests for tea. My husband and I happen to have very good English and French friends. We were wondering certain things because of some differences in behavior when they came to us or when we went to their house. So, in order not to find yourself in awkward situations, and especially so as not to embarrass others when you are invited, we thought we should learn all the codes in advance. Very precise codes, and on which Larissa is intractable. In, the, in, the in British living rooms, in, in for example, to hold you have to hold your cup, cup like this. this. And even, and even how you stir the spoon matters. You go, 12, 6, you go 12, from 12 to 6, 6 12, to 6, round, and you definitely round, don't rotate. So it's so elegant. elegant. 12, 6. six. six. Knowing how to hold your teacup may seem futile. But for Larissa, the reconquest of the Russian brand image abroad starts here. In one of the most chic restaurants in Moscow, she gives her etiquette lessons. With 18th century gilding and woodwork, and a masterful cupola, it's a meeting place frequented by all the country's elite. And to seduce its rich customers, Larissa even called on the heiress of one of the oldest French families, the Countess of Tilly. There must be 20 aristocratic families left, real aristocratic families. So indeed, I am a real countess. Hello. Hello, madam. This afternoon, a dozen students will pay $200 for four hours of lessons with Countess of Tilly. They are mostly young housewives married to rich Muscovites, 
and who want to learn to behave properly in society. For Larissa, there is an explanation for this enthusiasm. The country was closed, the country was closed for 70 years. I was raised in a Soviet country. That's why Russians don't smile. Not because they're rude. It's because of their difficult past. If we were smiling, it was because we had something to hide. Today, things are changing. People know that you have to smile. It's a basic rule. You say hello. You smile. You extend your hand. And above all, you smile. You only kiss a hand, for example, in a private place to the most important woman, the one hosting. Perfect, and that's great, because you don't kiss her. When you sit in a lounge, and you don't know anyone at all, we sit a bit in profile, like that. We don't cross our legs, okay? French etiquette is very casual. It puts the art of living and comfort first. It is a bit idle, but beautiful at the same time. It's quite close to the Russian spirit after all, and that's why we like it. We think it's more natural, and at the same time, it's very chic. Customers fascinated by French etiquette and elegance. We are far from the bling bling Russian cliché. There used to be a bad impression of Russians about 20 years ago because, in some ways, we thought they were coming with their money, that they were the kings of oil, and in some way, it gave them a bad image. Now, there is a return to the past, they are looking for the refined, luxurious, but beautiful, elegant side and not luxurious in your face. At the end of the course, all students receive their little certificate. To reconnect with the aristocracy and traditions lost over a century. This is the latest trend in Moscow's high society. Before, it was not the right time for etiquette. Communism was being built. And now it's the return of former Russia. <laughs> but while the golden youth cultivates nostalgia for Imperial Russia, among young people from disadvantaged neighborhoods, another form of going back in time is at work. One, that is much more worrisome. In this gym, a dozen teenagers are training in street fighting with knives. You prick and immediately after that, you cut. The other blocks and after that, he goes for at least two blows in a row. They are young neo-Nazi activists. They belong to one of the most dangerous groups in Russia, Restruct. Their spokesperson is called Daniel. He didn't want to tell us his age. Nazis, that's what the communists used to call us. We prefer to say national socialists. It was Adolf Hitler who was at the origin of this ideology. But Hitler waged war against your country and killed a lot of Russians, and yet you worship him. Hitler was not at war with the Russians, that's a misconception. He was fighting against the Soviet Union, which did not represent the true interests of the Russian people. The neo-Nazis in Restruct became known with this kind of video posted on the internet. It shows young homosexuals being captured and beaten up. <laughs> Behind these ultra-violent videos is a man. He goes by Tesek, meaning machete in Russian. He is a 29-year-old neo-Nazi leader, now imprisoned for inciting racial hatred. For over a year, with his gang, they kidnapped dozens of homosexuals to humiliate them and filmed them under duress. To justify their actions, they claimed that their victims were seeking to enter into relationships with minors. Daniel fully assumes that he has already participated in such acts. Don't you think that's cruel? Look, he wanted to have relationships with little boys. How can we show any leniency? What we do is very mild. It's no more severe than a slap on the wrist. The law does not allow us to do more. But today, 
homosexuals are no longer the only target of neo-Nazis. They have given themselves a new mission. Now, they claim to be fighting drug dealers. They allowed us to follow one of their operations. We meet up with them in the subway. Tonight, there are a good 20 of them, and a lot of them look underage. High school students or middle school students, the youngest are not even 15 years old. Among them, we find Daniel. Recruiting adolescents assures that these Russian neo-Nazis avoid trouble. The average age of participants in tonight's operation is 15 to 16. Because from the age of 18, police officers arrest our comrades and may accuse them of criminal acts. That's why our project was handed over to minors, to avoid legal proceedings. Tonight's operation consists of scaring off drug traffickers. That's all Daniel wanted to tell us. We follow the group without suspecting what will come next. Get to work. Onward. At the end of this alley, a car with all its lights on. We still don't understand what's going on. As the first man flees, a second is going to be caught by teenagers who are beating him right in front of our eyes, ten against one. Stop hitting him. Stop fucking hitting him. You'll kill him. The presence of our camera prompted Daniel to calm his troops. The man took advantage of this to escape. Where did he get away to? We realized that he's more seriously injured than we thought. Did you have a knife? Did you stab him? Yes, there was a lot of blood. How could you be so fucking stupid? Let's go, come on. At the other end of the alley, a second group caught up with the first man. Like the other occupant of the car, he is a Caucasian native. We are witnessing an outburst of racist violence. Why the hell were you running away? Because I was scared. Do you sell drugs? No. I swear on my mom's life. The neo-Nazis empty their victims' pockets. No trace of drugs. I wondered what was going on. Go ahead, check. You guys have made a mistake. A free beating. Let's go, let's go. That Daniel will struggle to justify. Did you find any drugs on them? Maybe, I don't know, I didn't ask, I just looked. Can you go see if you guys found any? I don't know, I think so, I'm going to see. I didn't see, did you find anything? No, but it's definitely them. It must be somewhere in their car. So-called dealers who probably aren't even. But that's not what's bothering Daniel the most. Right now, what worries me, is Article 105 coming for us? Wait for us here. Article 105 punishes murder in the Russian criminal code. He must be alive, he's gone. Stop shouting, the journalists don't need to hear that. Fuck, they filmed everything, they're not going to delete it. What do we tell them? We found some drugs and left it in the car? Yes, we have to lie to them, spin them a story. 
Why are we still here? We have to move. But we won't have any other explanation. Switch off the camera. Switch off the camera, quick. How can the authorities let gangs like this run the streets of Moscow? During filming, we witnessed another particularly shocking scene. The man on the ground is from Dagestan. He was just beaten and handcuffed by the same neo-Nazi group. A young extremist even films the whole scene to post online. When for the first time, a police patrol alerted by residents finally shows up. In front of the police, the young neo-Nazis claim to have arrested a drug dealer. <laughs> Where are the drugs? The drugs? He must be carrying it. But no trace of any drugs. And against all odds, it's the victim that the police will take away, aided by young extremists. There is nothing. I checked, there is nothing at all. Come on, get in the car before you get killed. The police are obviously in a hurry to leave the premises. What are you doing? We're taking him to the station. What will you do with him there? I don't know. The duty inspector will decide. The arrest at least allows the victim to escape his attackers, who, for their part, leave calmly and without concern. How many racist attacks have these extremists already committed? It's hard to know, because no one ever reports it. The victims don't want trouble. Nevertheless, one man agreed to testify. He is a construction worker and lives in a site cabin next to the house he's building. Hakmal came from Tajikistan eight months ago to work. What? <laughs> Here, we wash as well as cook. The three of us live together at the moment. But there are three more guys coming. We still have room to put beds in. We put that ourselves to insulate because it gets cold in winter. A few weeks after arriving in Moscow, Hagmal crossed paths with a group of young Russians. It happened on the suburban train. We were attacked. I don't know by whom. Skinheads or just ordinary young people. They beat us up. There were two of us. But there were a lot of them. It was older women who saved us. There were no policemen in the station. That's how we survived. Did they attack you for no reason? Yes, for nothing. Were they young? Yes. Younger than me. There were a lot of them. Nine or ten, I don't remember. Do you feel unsafe on the street today? Of course. Every day. Even when I go to buy bread, I feel unsafe at any time. Like Hagmal, in Moscow, more than one million immigrants are potential targets for extreme right groups. The threat that hangs over them doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. In a park in the capital, we filmed this shocking scene. These men are neo-Nazi activists out in the open. They're practicing their knife skills in broad daylight. A police patrol inquires about their presence in a public place. Then lets them continue. It is estimated that there are at least 20,000 neo-Nazi activists throughout Russia. In Moscow, nothing seems to be able to stop them. 
with the passivity of the authorities. The only glimmer of hope for immigrants in the city is a small association for the defense of human rights, civic assistance. In these premises, more than 100 people file in every day to solve administrative problems or to report assaults. It's your turn. Please come on through. Svetlana Ganushkina is the founder of Civic Assistance. For her actions towards immigrants living in Russia, this historic human rights activist was nominated five times for the Nobel Peace Prize. We showed her what we filmed on the streets of Moscow. I can't say I'm shocked because I know a lot of stories like that, they have become commonplace. But of course, I have a feeling of horror. What do the police do, normally, the police should put a stop to this delinquency. It's not the victim that needs to be arrested, but those who chased him and beat him up. Their IDs should be checked, but no, they feel like royalty. And the person who was beaten is the one who's taken away in the car. Here's hoping he's not beaten up again in the police station. With more than 20 years of activity, Svetlana saw the situation of immigrants in Russia deteriorate considerably. Amidst general indifference, do you think that today the authorities are really aware of what is going on? You know, if you look at the latest events in Russia, I have the impression that the powers that be aren't aware of anything. In my opinion, what is happening is madness. What we are now seeing on the screen has existed for a long time, but it's gaining momentum. It's getting worse and is becoming an outlet for all that negative energy. And people can get away with it, it's allowed. There are young people like that everywhere. In this country we can say that this is no longer a xenophobia epidemic but a real pandemic. Last year, eight people were killed and 53 others injured during racist attacks in Moscow. Official figures that are well below the reality of the situation. <laughs>